Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of us joining here in the room and also those of you joining online as well, it is such a pleasure to be here during uh, an incredibly historic time. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting me to take part. I uh, would like to briefly introduce our panelists who hardly need an introduction. Of course, we have Fatih Barol, who we've already heard from. Immediately to his left, we have Leila Benali, Minister of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development uh, for Morocco. Francesco La Camera, Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. And Nigel Topping, uh, the UN COP26 Climate Champion. Uh, Minister Benali, I want to direct the first question to you, but then open it up to the others as well. You know, hearing the um, Secretary's comments last night at the opening reception, something about how we, uh, blah, 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 we need to stop talking and take some action. Now, we are on stage, so the most we can do at this very moment is talk. So with that restriction, um, Minister, can you talk about what more can we do after the Inflation Reduction Act and amid an energy crisis, what more can we do to make sure that we make sure this moment turns into action? Thank you very much. Well, first, I'd like to thank um, the, the organizers and Secretary Granholm to uh, organize this very first uh, gathering. And I, I, mean, I agree with my friend Fatih Birol. I was also impressed when I heard the messages in the airport in, the, in a shuttle. So I found that quite, quite impressive. Um, what more can be done? I think um, we, we are very much, as, as we are co-chairing the power breakthrough with our friends from the UK, and we, have, uh, we are working inclusively, I think, with all the 15 signatories on the power breakthrough, because I think it's one of the major uh, breakthroughs that we have to, well, first decarbonize and also have, um, I would say, a rational discussion about climate change. And you mentioned, Amy, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, Act. I would slightly disagree with my friend Fatih Birol here by saying I think it's much more important than Paris. I think from um, a developing country perspective, like Morocco, we have been very ambitious in our renewable targets. Uh, we have exceeded the 42% installed capacity in terms of renewables. We've provided some sub subsidies to uh, concentrated solar power uh, a few years ago. We are very much uh, determined to do the same, to, to, do the same, to become um, a player in, in hydrogen. And we cannot do that without affordable, cost-competitive renewables. Um, so from that perspective, uh, I very much welcome uh, the Inflation Reduction Act because for us, it's very much uh, a signal to the world, to our friends in Europe indeed, and to ourselves because we really want to become uh, a major platform. Uh, I remember, and I finish on that, when I was in Berlin a few months ago, I provided a target to the, in, to the private investors, some of them are in the room, of $2 per kilogram for hydrogen. Um, a few weeks later, I received some offers of between $1.5 to $1.7 per kilogram. And there we go. So I'm very happy that the US is pushing the way forward to decrease costs, because at the end of the day, for our populations, for um, uh, our constituencies, for people who are voting for us, I think it's very important to come with affordable, sustainable energy. That's what we need. Thank you. Francesco and Nigel, I uh, would love to kind of drill down a little bit deeper on the breakthrough report. And uh, you're among the lead co-authors, along with Fatih and others, uh, about, uh, from that report. What are the highlights from that report about specific sectors where we need to make more progress? And what can we, uh, I think toward the end of that report, you talked about how other sectors that you may deserve some more attention. Uh, so we'd love to get a preview of what you're thinking um, for the coming months and years. Francesco? Uh, thanks. And actually, I, also myself, I've been impressed by the message uh, on, the, on the shuttle. I'll just, uh, <laughs> I'll just make and, and uh, so, uh, naturally, it's so short time from uh, Glasgow to talk about the impact breakthrough in this uh, very short term. But there are trends that I, I wish to, to underline more generally. First of all, uh, uh, if you think 10 years ago, there was still people thinking that uh, coal or clean coal may have a future. Uh, now, all we agree on the fact that renewables 
complemented by hydrogen, mainly green, and the sustainability of climate is the transformation where we are going. So culturally, this is very important. The last push came from the change in the US administration, and I'm also confident that the change in the Australian uh, administration will push this uh, idea uh, uh, forward. So, and we have seen that uh, the cost are declining. It's uh, absolutely uh, amazing that in the last three years, we have two digits of decreased cost in the main renewables technologies. We have seen that last year, 80% of the installed capacity was renewables. So, we are we are launching in this day uh, our job reports. Last year, 700 million jobs has been created in the renewable area. So these are clearly very, uh, very clear message on where we are, we are going. Yeah. Also, the, this crisis make clear, you know, some time, uh, 10 years ago, they were saying that renewables were going to be a niche. Now there are uh, people that say that we have problem with renewables because of the intermittency as the intermediacy of, uh, of resources is uh, intrinsic quality. But uh, I think this crisis make clear to us that the logistic, the trade, the transport are making the resources stable for the base loads. So the question is not the, the sun or the wind, it's there or not there, it's the logistic, it's the trade. So renewables can play the role of base load. And this closed the, 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 the good message. Uh, I'm, I'm less optimistic than Fatih on, uh, on the spring that is coming. And I will explain why. So in general, there is no doubt where we are going. No doubt at all. And this is unstoppable. And the market will drive there, us there. The fact is that the speed and the scale of this transformation is not coherent with the achievement of the Paris Agreement goal. We are very close to lose the 1.5 and still close to lose the two degrees. So this is where we are. Naturally, we have installed capacity record last year. We are going to have another one, but we need triple the investment in renewables, not 10% more. So the dimension is, uh, is, is really daunting. So uh, I wish to make clear to everyone that at least our numbers say that we have strongly increase investment in the transition if you want to get the result that is coherent with the Paris Agreement. The last two comments. One is uh, uh, to concentrate on the technologies that we have. I think in the Biden summit last year, I was uh, very clear that in 2013, we realized that we've been able to reach the, the, achieve the Paris Agreement goal. So why we are talking about technologies that will give us a result not in this decade, and perhaps not in the, in the next one. So we have to concentrate on what we have, if we want to get the result that we can really get. If not, the carbon, uh, the carbon uh, budget will disappear uh, fast. Three things, so I can close in short, that I wish to say what we agreed, especially in Africa, Southeast Asia. We have presented a plan for uh, for uh, interconnectivity in Africa and in Southeast Asia. Don't think that the Paris Agreement is at stake here in the US, thanks to this administration or in European Union. The Paris Agreement is at stake in Africa and is at stake in Southeast Asia or in Asia. So we have to work on the Greece. The multilateral financial institution has to make efforts together with the private to provide, uh, to provide this. The legal environment for reducing risk is most, more important. The cooperation is very important. I think the G20 in Indonesia send this message, but we need a different kind of cooperation. What does it mean to mitigate CO2 emission in Africa? The question is to help Africa to build an industrial sector that is coherent, creating the demand for the clean energy. So it's very important that we work for building the middle class of this continent. If not working on the mitigation for Africa, it's no sense. And they will ask to use more gas because they think they have the right to do this. So we have to organize our cooperation efforts in this, uh, in this way. 
So uh, my last message on this, on the breakthrough, could play a very important role, but it's very important that uh, the government, uh, from the commitment, are able to go in action. We are very far from where we have to be. This I, I want to make clear to you today. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Francesco. Uh, Nigel, would love to turn to you uh, to talk a little bit more about that report and, and what's in store. Well, um, first of all, th um, thanks, Secretary, for in, in convening us. Um, and thanks to Fatih and Francesco for the collaboration on the report. You know, my, my, my mandate that I share with Mahmoud Mahidin from Egypt is to bring in the non-state actors, so particularly in this case, the private sector. So, um, you know, just to provoke a little bit, the private sector is sometimes a little bit ahead of um, the public sector. We, we launched the private sector breakthroughs in January before COP ac across all sectors. So one thing to your question, I would urge you, let's extend this agenda multilaterally to more sectors, to buildings, to cement, to shipping, steel, methane. There's a lot of other very heavy emitting sectors that we could do with this kind of international collaboration on. Um, same thing to say is we are seeing, despite the crisis, growing momentum from the private sector in terms of more. We have 3,500 companies since Glasgow have committed in a robust way to halving emissions by 2030. But there's a lot more work on sectoral pathways. You might have seen the, the publication by Mission Possible Partnership and SBTI this week um, and a lot of those sectoral collaborations, whether it's getting to zero and shipping or steel zero or ze zero carbon freight buyer, so you know, supply and demand side. Um, uh, Fatih and I are going to have a conversation about exponential maths. One of the key findings in this report is 10 years ago we were at 120,000 EVs, now we're at 6.6 .6 million, that's more than 50x. That's more than doubling every two years. If you double every two years, you get 32x in 10 years. So we're at 10%. You keep that more than doubling every two years. We'll be way ahead of 50% by 2030. I'll, I'll, t I'll take a wager, Fatty, that we're north of 80%. We know historically, empirically, that that's the shape of sectoral transformations. They go exponential. And it's driven by this kind of collaboration and by belief in our power to innovate. So it's like setting the, the, the $2, then the $1.50, then the dollar target, being clear about deployment targets. I think that's one of the most important things is, is collective deployment targets and then clarity from the IRA, from Europe, from Australia, from every country about what are they actually going to deliver sectorally to help drive the cost down um, and, and the volume up. So um, I think let's refresh our exponential maths, uh, re refresh our belief in our ability collectively to, to innovate. And then there's some really um, you know, quite specific recommendations for the five sectors so far covered. And I hope we have 10 sectors covered next year so that we're covering more like 90% of global emissions. Great, thank you so much for that, Nigel. Fatih, I want to come back to you and uh, give you perhaps a chance to respond to some healthy disagreements. Uh, I think we're going to need disagreements in order to make progress, so uh, we should welcome that. But also, drawing on your comments a few moments ago about how spring is coming, uh, to push back on that a little bit, you know, looking at the headlines and uh, countries doubling down on coal and uh, developing more natural gas uh, to respond to this crisis, you know, experts tell me that the, getting through this winter is one thing, but then the, the storages will be empty in Europe and next winter could actually be more difficult. So given those pretty dire uh, headlines, how, how can we ensure that this is actually a movement toward clean energy instead of a step back toward fossil fuels? Uh, thanks, uh, so many questions, but let me try to answer the first one, it is the easiest one. Let the colleagues think, uh, I think it is Francesco thinks, that I, I am too optimistic. So it is the first time I get this critics in my life, so I, I am very happy. I, so this is, this, is, this is wonderful, it is music to my ears and I take it, so this is, this is, this is one thing. But to say that uh, uh, our optimism comes, uh, I think it's a legitimate optimism, and it's a credible optimism, it's based on numbers. We, all, we only talk about when we are pessimistic, based on numbers, when we are optimistic, based on numbers. But this is uh, aside. Now, the issue of uh, Europe. Uh, some of you may know, uh, 24th of February is the, uh, the invasion. 1st of March, we came up with a 10-point plan for uh, Europe, what Europe needs to do to prepare itself for this uh, winter. And as of today, about 86% of our gas storage is full in Europe. I think this is a good uh, success story. And in the absence of any bad 
surprise. I mean, there are great many best surprises, but if not another best surprise. If there is a terminal problem in the United States, if there is a Norwegian pipeline strikers, until this Europe can, and a normal winter, I'm not saying warm winter, but normal winter, Europe can go through with some bruises here and there through this uh, winter. But when we came to uh, February, the storage level will come to between 20 and 25 percent. So how we make this 85 percent or 86 percent, these two things helped us in Europe. Among, in addition to the measures that European countries have taken, one of them is uh, Europe was still able to get gas from Russia. The second biggest driver was China. In fact, China should have, in a normal China economic growth, China should have uh, imported 30 BCM more gas. But since Chinese economy was very weak, this 30 BCM was available for the markets and Europe got it. Now, after February, for the next winter, there will be no, most likely, no Russian gas. And if Chinese economy recovers and becomes strong, China, China is it number one top LNG importer of the world, China will import uh, LNG and the markets uh, will be much tighter and there are not many, only 22 BCM new LNG capacity coming to the uh, market, it may be difficult for Europe. So next, uh, uh, as of February, another challenge is starting for uh, uh, Europe. But for me, the, in, the, in Europe, the most important task now among the European countries to show solidarity, to help each other, to support each other in terms of trade, in terms of uh, electricity, gas, uh, to support each other. And today, if they are using coal, and they are using coal, it is very well, it's very legitimate. It will not change the trends, to be honest with you. It's a legitimate uh, one because we need Europe to go through this. And again, it will not be easy. Lots of, lots of economic, social and political bruise in, in Europe. But uh, I believe we will go through this and the solidarity will be extremely important. But after we come to February, another chapter starts and we will come up with some suggestions there too. Thank you so much for that, Fatih. Um, Minister Benali, I want to come back to you and uh, you alluded to this a little bit earlier and so did Francesco, so uh, we can bring in him as well. But, you know, th the urgency of ensuring that developing countries uh, throughout Africa and Southeast Asia, how can we ensure that they can develop their economies, perhaps using natural gas in some instances if needed, but also ensuring that the technologies that we're developing today, industrial processes that require renewable energy instead of natural gas, for example, how can we ensure that those parts of the world also get these technologies? To your point, they need to be affordable. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that. I'm just going to give you a, a case study, a real story that happened on the, in the morning of Glasgow, uh, 1st of November of last year. We were all gathered at COP26 in Glasgow, um, and Algeria cut the gas to Europe on the 31st of October. And at the time when I met my European counterparts, and I'm very happy that uh, Fatih spoke about solidarity, um, my message was very clear. I mean, uh, we are happy to power past coal, to stop using, uh, to, to, to put our hands on our heart and say, we will not build any new coal plant, we swear, but I have no gas in the system. I have two CCGTs that are idle. I have a transcontinental pipeline, 10 BCM pipeline that is empty. Um, so that's, at the time, I remember I used Ukraine as a benchmark by saying, well, you, there is a, an obscure country in uh, Central Europe who has reversed pipelines with its neighboring countries to get access to the international LNG market because LNG has that beauty of being relatively uh, liquid market and it provides security. So from that perspective, I remember, I, short, long story short, um, I, w I never thought that a few, few months later, history will be faster than us. So to get back to your earlier question, indeed, um, we need to ensure that our um, development is, is really much taken into account. And to get back to the earlier point about climate change, I mean, indeed, 
uh, for, for many countries is a, is a question of survival. Climate is a question of survival when you have a large share of your sometimes informal sectors being wiped out because of uh, uh, floods or uh, natural disasters, etc. Or, and I, yesterday in New York, I was having breakfast with the uh, Pacific Islands and Tuvalu being one of the first islands to potentially disappear, not in 2060, not in 2050, potentially in 2040. So I don't want to start the day even more pessimistic than our friend <laughs> Francesco. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are some sovereignty and, and, and security aspects that are taken into account. But in parallel, we should not lose sight of the importance of research, development and innovation. So in, in Morocco, what we try to do in parallel while managing uh, a, 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 ga a real gas crisis, um, we made sure that our uh, research platforms and Irezen, who is our institute, for research on, on energy technologies and, and, and new energies who are here, um, we make sure that they have the means that they, that they need to continue um, to have to develop their networks of innovation and their networks of deployment. Uh, we do that in Morocco, in Africa, with some of our centers in, uh, in, uh, in other countries. But I think it's important not to lose sight that that innovation and, and research uh, continues and, and doesn't get into the, the dead valley uh, because politicians we we we, we, are, we tend to uh, to uh, to ensure, we tend to be short termist at time but there is nothing short term about policies Thank you. and policies about climate change perhaps the longest problem we will all ever have to deal with uh, in a couple of moments we would love to invite um, to the stage some ministers for some. Uh, uh, interventions and some comments there. Uh, but first, a concluding question for our panelists, looking ahead to uh, the next COP in Egypt, what do we need to do between now and then and coming out of COP, what do we need to get out of that to make sure that we continue on a path forward despite uh, the energy crisis and supply chain challenges and everything uh, that goes along with that? Nigel, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I think we need to do more, more countries and companies to commit to the breakthrough agenda um, and then to bring to Sharm El Sheikh specific deployment commitments so capital and numbers of plants numbers of gigatons numbers of tons whatever the sector is um, and specific offtake agreements um, and then as I said extend the breakthrough agenda to a few more sectors so that we can cover more of the, uh, the total emissions by 28 COP28. Great thank you so much. Francesca? So my, my hope is that uh, this COP will, uh, will uh, uh, I'd say, change the, the, the way the COP are running. Uh, we have to abandon the negotiation mode of the COP. That's not any more useful. We don't, know, we don't need spending nights for rewards in a political declaration. So I hope that uh, the COP will uh, focus on action. It should be an African COP, but this means that we have really government to go there and make clear what is your commitment for Africa, practical, it's how to do things, having plan. We will try to present in the occasion of COP five investment plans for Africa. Who want to put the money? Huh? Who want to be engaged in this exercise? Egypt has their own uh, program, so it's the time to show, uh, uh, say, willingness to go for action. And then we can move to the COP28, where we can open to East Asia, having the North, the South, East and West joined together in action. So please, think about action, not anymore about negotiation, political declaration. We had enough political declaration. Great, thank you so, mu uh, so much, Mr. Ben Ali. What are you looking for in this COP? <laughs> um, well, I think we, we all know uh, Africa being a land of solutions and a land of, uh, of action. Hopefully, I think we will, uh, we will go there all equipped because we all know what needs to be done. We, we know that with the right economies of scale, with the right involvement with the private sector, with the right financial models, um, we, 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 should, we should get something going. Um, I think what 
where I will be watching personally very carefully is whether we will be able as an international community to restore trust. Because I think trust has been lost, uh, well, this year definitely, but over the last few years uh, towards the issues, the geopolitical issues, climate change, etc. So whether we are able to restore trust between ourselves, between states, between politicians, populations, central bankers as well, uh, etc. Et I think that would be something that will uh, make this COP and the next COP in, in the UAE successful. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Fatih, let's uh, conclude with that question from you. What are you looking, uh, what kind of action can we get out of COP um, this year? If I may, I want to give one rather uh, varying statistics. At the IEA, many of you know, every year we look at how many people have no access to electricity year by year. Last 20 years, each year, there was a very good trend. Every year, number of people who have no access to electricity was declining. And this year, for the first time, 22, it is set to increase because of the crisis we have, 20 million increase. It is very varying and it is main happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I uh, agree with my colleagues, it is time to uh, advance economies, industries uh, world especially, to show solidarity with uh, Africa, not to be prescriptive to the African uh, countries, understanding their priorities and show uh, real uh, action and hope that uh, it will help to increase in clean energy transition in those countries. Thank you so much for that, Fatih. would like now to invite to the stage uh, Graham Stewart, Minister for Climate Change at the United Kingdom for uh, an intervention. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for convening us and the 6,000 others who, as you say, are uh, registered at this event. Um, this sh city is a shining example of reinvention and innovation, um, and we can all learn from its approach. Nearly a year ago at uh, COP26 in Glasgow, the then Prince of Wales, now, of course, our new King Charles III, implored the world to act, to act fast. And I know that is very much the theme, Madam Secretary, of what we are talking about today. Today, I'm proud to say more than 90% of global GDP is covered by net zero commitments. When we took on the COP presidency in 2019, it was only 30%. But as is the focus of today, those pledges are meaningful and important, but it's action that counts. And the big question is how do we deliver those pledges? Now, we in the UK have always been a clean energy leader. We were among the first to make a legislative commitment to net zero. Uh, and I want to reaffirm my government's commitment to deliver on that. We intend to get to carbon neutrality in the most efficient and business friendly way possible. And I think, uh, as has been said by various commenters today, the IRA, I think in terms of driving action in the United States, the world's largest economy, in lowering those costs, probably one of the most significant steps that we could see. Just recently, the world's largest offshore wind farm opened off the coast of Yorkshire, where my own constituency is. In fact, it's named after Hornsey, which is a small town in my constituency. So I believe the UK has the kit, it's got the capability, but we know that unilateral action is not enough. To meet our goals, we must harness the full power of collective action. That's why at COP26, 45 world leaders launched the Breakthrough Agenda a commitment to strengthen international collaboration so that clean technologies become the most affordable and attractive option in all regions by 2030. And Special Envoy Kerry and I were involved in Globe International years ago, bringing legislators together. I remember in the Russell Building uh, in Washington talking about how do we uh, go across borders to make sure we build, uh, make uh, projects to, lower, to drive down the cost curve and make uh, projects investable. And I'm thrilled that today this breakthrough agenda will continue under the Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation after COP27. And I want to thank the Breakthrough Report authors for their clear analysis and firm recommendations for urgent, coordinated international action. So what does all this actually mean? I'd like to pick four areas, if I may. Firstly, standards. Shared international standards such as emission standards for clean hydrogen or steel or sustainability standards for battery supply chains are vital 
for unlocking trade and investment, indeed making these areas investable. Secondly, market creation. Governments need to send clear policy signals and companies need to commit to procuring clean technologies so that they give suppliers confidence to invest and scale production. And we look forward to continuing this important work through the Industrial Deep Decarbonisation Initiative and, of course, the First Movers Coalition. Thirdly, research, development and demonstration. We must coordinate our efforts to deliver transformational projects that showcase innovations such as the five flagship projects under the Green Powered Future Mission. to the US-led Global Clean Energy Technologies Demonstration Challenge. And lastly, and as we've just been partly heard discussion, we must strengthen our collective offer of assistance to the Global South. By aligning, coordinating and reinforcing our assistance efforts, we can ensure clean technologies are affordable and accessible for all. So I want to invite every country here today to join me in responding to the recommendations in the breakthrough report by COP27. By doing so, we can use the weight of collective action to accelerate a just and global transition for the benefit of everyone, driving jobs, growth and opportunity. And the UK looks forward to working with all of you to turn clean energy ambition, most importantly, into action. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Minister Stewart. I now would like to invite to the stage uh, Minister Diego Pardo, uh, of, uh, Minister of Energy for Chile. So, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, it is an honor to be at the main stage. Uh, I just have three minutes, so I'll be straight to the point. Uh, last day, Secretary Granholm uh, invited us all to exceed our expectation and reach for the sky, right? And this is so true for Chile. Uh, we're a small country in the Southern Hemisphere. It is spring there by now. Uh, and as of today, our electricity matrix is about 30 gigas of capacity. Uh, in order to meet our goals of decarbonization, we need to build another 30 gigas. So, uh, and we need to do that in about a decade. Um, our best year, we were able to plug in about 2.5 gigas of capacity. So, you, most of you guys are engineers, so you can do the math. Even if we are able to uh, multiply our best year for the next decade, it's not enough. We need to, again, exceed the expectation and reach for the sky. We are committed to the goals of decarbonization. Uh, by the end of the month, we are closing two major coal power plants. A uh, third one will be uh, closed in, by the end of the year, in December. Uh, all this, of course, has been preceded by a fair and just transition process. This is far from perfect, but uh, our process will be publicly accountable. We are gathering this experience and will be made publicly available for all of you guys so we can learn about this process and improve our transition processes. Uh, but as you can see, we are committed to our decarbonization path. But our political commitment is not enough. We need resources and innovation of the private sector. Uh, the investment required in our generation and transmission uh, is up to $20 billion. This is what we require to raise. Which takes me to the point I want to highlight from the Breakthrough Agenda Report, that is uh, international finance uh, mechanisms. <laughs> According with the report, the level of investment in low carbon solution needs uh, to be increased from about $400 billion in last year to over a trillion per year. It's very similar to the Chilean energy matrix, we need to double the capacity of the financial uh, mechanisms. Additional, this increase in capacity uh, should not only involve debt mechanisms, but also technical support, 
and some degree of subsidies. Let me finish, because it is spring in my country, with an optimistic example of Cerro Dominador, which is the first CSP power plant in South America. Uh, and is located in Chile and came online in June last year. The project had initially financial struggles and uh, we as a government were able to secure a 65 million uh, loan by the German Development Bank and a subsidy of 15 million euros that was undertaken by the European Union, the Latin American Investment Facility. Today, Cerro Dominador adds 110 megawatts of capacity. It has more than 17 hours of uh, accumulating uh, thermal power and is planning to scale up the project and plug in about another 500 megas of capacity. The scaling of the project is also estimated to cost just a fraction of the previous project because that's what happened when you learn by doing. Uh, the cost of doing it again, it's much smaller. This not only enables us to produce energy in dark hours, which is essential to uh, meeting our decarbonization goals, but also, more importantly, looking with optimism this process. Uh, it is therefore, and with this I will be finishing, the interaction between governments, private sector, and finance mechanism, international finance mechanism, which will lay down the key for success in the next step and uh, for reducing emission and ultimately cooling down the planet, which is probably what we are all looking for. So I will accept your invitation. Let us work together. Let us uh, exceed our expectation and let us reach for the sky. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for those comments, um, Minister Pardo and Minister Stewart also. And a big thank you to our panelists for this wonderful conversation. A lot more action to be had, but I think we're off to a good start. So thank you so much. Please welcome United States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry.